Well, hey, fellas. Happy Friday. Um, so today is our day when you guys tell me uh, what the vocabulary means. And then also we finished up the book so that you guys can take an iron test. Remember, all these Merlin Mission books are like two to three points apiece. So Jack and Annie have gone through the stages of their journey to find the Sword of Light. First, they had the um, knight, the uh, water knight, help them across the first cove. Then the spider queen helped them climb up and out of the second one. Then Kathleen and Teddy came along and they turned into selkies and swam like seals. And then now finally they're in the final cove. They have found the Sword of Light and they've answered a question, an ancient question of what is the purpose of the sword? And they said the purpose of the sword is to bring peace. So that's kind of where we're at. All right, chapter 11, Sword and Rhyme. The sea serpent moved its head close to Jack and Annie and hissed a long whispery The serpent's flicking tongue touched the sword. Jack's heart nearly stopped, but then the serpent slowly pulled back its head and began to uncoil itself from the rocky island. The monster kept uncoiling its great body until once again a wide ring surrounded the cove like a circle of green hills. Then the serpent's head sank beneath the water with barely a ripple. It was impossible to tell where its body started and where it ended. Jack and Annie lowered the sword of light and laid it back on the rock. Then they let out a huge sigh of relief. Kath Kathleen and Teddy poked their seal heads down from the calm waters. Bark, bark, they barked. Jack and Annie laughed. It's safe to come out now, Annie called. The seals hauled themselves onto the rocky island and plopped on their sides. The sword helped us answer the ancient question, said Jack. They all looked at the sword of light. It glowed brightly even as the sun slipped below the horizon and the purple sky was fading to twilight. We still have to get it out of here before it's completely dark, said Annie. I know, said Jack, but how? Look at Merlin's rhyme, said Annie. Jack took the shell and read the last rhyme again. With, sword and rhyme, with rhyme and sword, your home is near. Jack looked up. That doesn't make sense. Maybe it does, said Teddy. They turned around. Teddy and Kathleen were standing behind them. Their seal skins had slipped off and they were human again. Maybe it calls for a magical rhyme, said Teddy. I am a magician, remember? Annie laughed. How could we forget? Teddy grinned. Sorry, there's a UPS truck outside my window right now and it's like very loud. So I apologize in advance for that noise. Jack grinned. I've gotten much better at my, or Teddy grinned. I've gotten much better at my rhymes, he said. Just watch. He rubbed his hands together. Then he carefully picked up the sword of light. He gripped its handle with both hands and pointed the silver blade towards the treehouse on the distant sea cliff. Teddy took a deep breath and shouted, Oh, sword of light, now light the night. Teddy paused. Jack grew worried. Teddy always had problems finishing his rhymes, and even the ones he did finish never worked like they were supposed to. Kathleen stepped closer to the young sorcerer. Say it again, she said. Teddy called out, Oh, sword of light, now light the night. Kathleen finished the rhyme in selkie language. My ebrio straw it bright. The sword began to vibrate in Teddy's hands. There was a roar and a blast of white light. Shimmering beams shot through the dark. The beams wiggled and waved and then streamed together to make a glittering bridge. The bridge spanned the purple darkness of the dusk. It stretched from the rocky island to the middle of the cove to the sea cliff above the coast. When Teddy lowered the sword, the bridge remained in the sky. Wow, said Annie. What did you say to finish the rhyme, Kathleen? Make a bridge strong and bright, Kathleen told her. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say, said Teddy. Indeed, said Kathleen, smiling. She took Teddy's hand, then turned to Jack and Annie. Tis a bright bridge to take you from my world back to yours. You mean we can walk on it, asked Annie. Try, said Teddy. Oh, man, said Jack. He laughed nervously. Then he raised his foot and put it on the light. It felt solid. He put his other foot on it and took a step forward. The light felt as firm as brick. Annie stepped on the light bridge beside him. It was wide enough for them to stand side by side. This is so cool, she said. Wait, do not forget this, said Teddy. He carefully handed Annie, Jack and Annie the sword of light. Oh my gosh, now there's a helicopter, y'all. Together, they gripped the handle of the sword. What about you guys, asked Jack. I must return to my cave now, said Kathleen, or my sisters will worry. And I should see Kathleen return home and then go back to the future of Camelot. After you stay for supper with me and my sisters, Kathleen said to Teddy. Oh, said Jack. He wanted to have supper with them too. He wanted to spend more time with Teddy and Kathleen. We'd better get going, Jack, said Annie. It's almost dark. Okay, said Jack. Goodbye for now, said Kathleen, and thank you. It's amazing how you defeated the enemy. The sea serpent wasn't really our enemy, said Jack. He was like the spider queen. They both seemed really scary till we got to know them. Yeah, said Jack. 
Will we see you again? Annie asked Teddy and Kathleen. Yes. I have a feeling you'll see both of us soon, said the Selkie. We'll find you when you least expect it, said Teddy. Now, my friends, you must go. Night comes quickly upon you. Farewell. Farewell, said Jack and Annie. They turned and started walking up the bright bridge. High above the water, the sword's light swung over the cove like a swaying lantern. The water below shimmered with sparkling ripples. Jack heard two splashes. He stopped and listened. Go, go, whispered Annie. Jack started walking. They climbed higher and higher till they came to the end of the path. They stepped off the bridge onto the rocky shore. They climbed the, clutching the handle of the sword, they looked back. The shining bridge shattered into a million pieces of golden light. Like the sparks of a firecracker, the glittering pieces rained down through the sky and burned out. The cove below was dark and silent, except for the distant barking of seals. Chapter 12, the, 12, the Isle of Avalon. Now what, said Jack. Now I thank you, said the deep voice. Merlin, cried Annie. Merlin stepped out of the shadows. He wore his red magician cloak and his long white beard shined, beard shined in the radiant glow of the sword. You brought the sword of light out of the gloom, he said, just before nightfall on the summer solstice. Why did we have to get it on the summer solstice, said Jack. This is the day when the powers of the ice wizard of winter are the weakest, said Merlin. The ice wizard of winter, said Annie. Did the sword belong to him? Did we steal it? No, said Merlin. Long ago, the ice wizard stole the sword from the lady of the lake and brought it to his kingdom above the North Sea. Merlin pointed up to the snow-capped mountains. The wizard soon discovered the sword of light was useless, for the lady of the lake had placed a spell upon it that made it worthy only powerful only in the hands of worthy mortals. Still, the wizard refused to part with it. He buried it at the bottom of the storm, the cove, the cove of the stormy coast, said Jack. Yes, said Merlin. Only recently did the seabirds tell me of the store's, sword's whereabouts. I knew I needed worthy mortals to retrieve it. So I sent you on the summer solstice when the ice wizard could send no storms to keep you from finding it. He could only throw the cloak of the old gray ghost over you. So the ice wizard sent the fog, said Annie. And did he put the sea monster in the cove, said Jack? Merlin smiled. No, the sea serpent actually serves the lady of the lake. Long ago, he took it upon himself to find the sword and guard it. Should any mortal survive the storms and gales, they still had to prove themselves worthy by answering the serpent's question. I believed you two would be able to answer the question wisely, and I was right. Your rhyme did help us, said Jack. He and Annie carefully handed the sword of light to Merlin. Will you put the sword in the stone now, asked Annie, so Arthur can pull it out someday and become king? No. This sword is even more powerful than the sword in the stone, said Merlin. This sword has a name. Excalibur. Excalibur, said Jack and Annie. I will take it back to the Isle of Avalon, said Merlin, and return it to the Lady of the Lake. Some day after Arthur is king, she will give it to him. The sword will help him face many challenges bravely and wisely. He will... Merlin was interrupted by a strange sound from the water below. It sounded like the deep bellow of a foghorn. What is it? said Jack. One last thing to do, said Merlin. He raised the sword and pointed it towards the cove of the stormy coast. Like the beam of a giant searchlight, the sword's light streamed over the black water. Merlin moved the beam back and forth as if he were searching for something. Ah, he said. There he is. The light revealed the gigantic head of the sea serpent. Its yellow lamplight eyes shined back at them. He mourns now, said Merlin, for he has lost his purpose in being here. Tis time we helped him home to the magic waters of Avalon. The magician lifted the sword. The beam made a path to show the monster the passage out of the cove. The giant serpent slid through the water and disappeared beneath the waves of the dark summer sea. His mission is done, said Annie. As is yours, my friend, said Merlin. You must climb the ladder to your treehouse and go home. By the light of the sword, Jack and Annie climbed their way up the rope ladder and into the treehouse. When they looked out the window, they saw Merlin standing in the light of the sword. Bye, Jack and Annie called. The magician raised his arm and spread his fingers in a wave of farewell. Merlin's gesture stirred something in Jack's memory, but he wasn't sure what it was. Let's go, said Annie. Jack took the seashell out of his pocket and pointed to the words Frog Creek. I wish we could go home, he said. Here's what this Excalibur looks like, by the way. Wait, said Annie, our shoes, we left them on the beach. Too late, the wind started to blow. The treehouse started to spin. It spun faster, then faster. Everything was still, absolutely still. Jack opened his eyes. A warm summer breeze wafted into the treehouse and the noon sun shined between the tree leaves. No time at all had passed. Merlin was the water knight, said Jack. Huh, said Annie. 
When he said goodbye, Merlin gave us the same wave the water knight gave us, said Jack. Remember? He raised his hand and imitated the gesture. You're right, said Annie. Why didn't I think of that? He always helps us to get started on the mission. And now we have three things from him, said Jack. He put the pale blue shell on the floor, next to the royal invitation and the yellow autumn leaf. Then he looked at Annie. Home, he said. She nodded. They climbed down the rope ladder and started barefoot through the camp, or uh, through the damp leafy, leafy woods. I guess we'll just have to tell Mom we lost our shoes in a time before Camelot, said Jack. Yeah, said Annie, on our way to get the Sword of Light that was stolen by the Ice Wizard and guarded by a giant sea serpent who served the Lady of the Lake. Right, said Jack. A simple explanation. You ready to go swimming at the lake, said Annie? Jack remembered the thrill of being a seal and zooming through the deep water. You know, it just won't be the same without Kathleen and Teddy, he said. We won't be seals. We can pretend, said Annie. Let's hurry before Mom says it's too late to go. They took off running and ran barefoot through the woods over sticks and leaves through the dappled noon light. Then they ran down the street and were out of breath by the time they reached their yard. <gasps> hey, look, Annie said and pointed at the porch. Sitting in front of the door were their sneakers. Jack and Annie climbed the porch and picked up their shoes. As Jack turned his over, fine white sand fell out and a couple of tiny silver pebbles. Ha, who, what, he said. A seagull screeched overhead. They looked up. The gull screeched again, then flew away and disappeared into the light. Annie shrugged. A little leftover magic, she said. Then she called through the screen door. Mom, we're ready. And that is the end of our story. So we are officially finished with book number 31. Um, there are a couple of cool notes in the back. Um, she says... Um, Selkies are seal people who took human shape, which I've already told you about. She said many Celtic tales also tell of water horses that live in giant and Scottish lakes and of the legendary gray man, a bearded giant who spreads his fog cloak over the Scottish and Irish Isles. Um, most of the time, the water horses aren't good, though. Kelpies are bad. Anyway, stories of giant sea serpents appear in tales from all over the world and... Um, of course, while look, working on this book, she was inspired by the tales of King Arthur. So, like, the sword bridge um, was inspired by the sword bridge in the French tale Lancelot. Um, and also, um, she was talking about how Excalibur is given to King Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. And um, some sources call it the Sword of Light. Depends on what you read. There's a lot of King Arthur stories. So yeah, anyway, um, that was our story. So I will see you guys next Monday and we will begin book number 32, which I don't actually know what the next one is. I don't know, it's a mystery. I guess we'll find it next Monday. Toodaloo.